It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, Minister, last week we learned about an Ottawa man by the name of Eric Law. Mr. Law is 63 years old and has been diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis, diabetes, cancer behind his right eye, and a serious thyroid condition. Yet the Community Care Access Centre in Champlain that once treated Mr. Law has told him that they are no longer able to provide services to him because of an 11.3% increase in new and sicker patients. I don't know how much sicker you have to get. Minister, how many people across Ontario are being refused care by their local CCAC because your government wastes money on scandals like eHealth, Orange Gas Plants and Mars? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, of course, uh, appreciate, both appreciate the question, and I'd be happy to follow up uh, with this individual case uh, that has been referenced by the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, Mr. Speaker, it's important that we do whatever we can to ensure that uh, particularly uh, individuals, patients with complex needs, uh, it certainly seems that this individual fits into that category, uh, are able to provide or receive the services that they require. You know, it's uh, our CCACs, there are 14 of them across the province, and they uh, are the, uh, the primary mechanism through which we provide those services, uh, particularly home care, but also community services with uh, many, many transfer payment agencies uh, and individuals that are providing that Answer. support. Uh, it's important to note that this year, in fact, in the budget, we uh, significantly increased our funding to home and community services yeah. by $260 well, thank you. million. Dollars, thank, Mr. You Speaker. thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Minister, <clears throat> back to the Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, it, it's only going to get worse. As you know, the Conference Board of Canada recently reported that even with a, without a single new program, a single new drug, or a single new health service, your government will have to increase health funding each year by 4.7% just to accommodate population growth and inflation. That's twice of what you've budgeted for so far. So, Minister, how can you possibly accommodate the needs of an aging population when you're paying $11 billion in just debt interest payments alone this year, $11 billion when interest payments are at a 20-year low? What happens when they go up? How many more people won't be able to get frontline health care services? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we are providing more care to individuals uh, like the one referenced by the Leader of the Opposition, and partly because of that $260 million increase to home and community care, which actually represents a 6 per cent increase in funding for that sector. And it's allowed us to do many things, including uh, setting that target of a five-day wait time uh, for individuals from point of assessment to get their first treatment through home care. And in fact, as uh, the member opposite, I think, is well aware, we've dramatically increased our funding for CCACs. We, in fact, we've doubled, we've doubled it in the last decade from just over $1 billion to $2.4 billion where it stands now, and that's an increase of a significant increase that makes a difference uh, and can translate actually very specific to there are more than a quarter of a million people that are receiving home care through our CC Answer. CCACs, Mr. Speaker, than were a decade ago. So we continue to make those investments. We're seeing the results, the improvement in the quality of care Thank is you. so important to those individuals. Final supplementary. Well, Minister, you're already firing uh, health care workers and cutting frontline services. The Timmins and District Hospital yep. is feeling the full brunt of your inability to budget properly and your wasteful spending and inability to set priorities. They currently face a $4.5 million deficit Order. and they're being forced to make tough decisions. They're cutting jobs and cutting services. They're actually laying off 40 health care workers, including nurses, and removing 26 hospital beds. So will you admit to the people, like Mr. Law and the people of Timmins, that this is just the first of many cuts that you'll be making to health care in Ontario over the next four years because of your fiscal mismanagement? Yep, that's Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can only imagine how serious the cuts in yeah. personnel in health care might have been had the, had the party opposite actually won that last election. And, and Mr. Speaker, the... The reality is that the transformation that we've made in health care through the, the health care, the action plan for health, the, through the, the excellent 
through, through the, the, the mechanisms that we put in place to improve the quality of health through our hospitals and through our home and community care have already had significant impacts in terms of the uh, delivery of health services. And to get back again to the original component of the member's uh, question on the CCACs, half of patients with, their co with complex care needs uh, referred through the hospital had their first service visit within one day, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It can't get any better than yeah, that. Sir. And in fact, 90 percent of patients had their first visit between one and five days. Yeah. So we are making a difference. We're improving quality of care. We're Thank doing you. it on budget. Yeah. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It's obvious your government's poor fiscal management is affecting frontline front health care, whether you want to admit it or not, Minister. Yeah. As of August, the Hamilton, Niagara, Haldeman and Brant Lynn's wait times were worse than the provincial target in areas like MRIs, CT scans and knee replacements. And this Lynn had the great highest overall wait time for cancer surgeries in Ontario. Now, my colleagues and I in the Progressive Service Caucus believe that the dedicated health care workers in those regions work hard day in and day out to help Ontarians who need their help. But Minister, you're not giving them the resources and the tools they need to do their job. Do you really think that cutting 58 registered nursing positions, the equivalent to 110,000 hours of care each year, at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, is going to help improve the times in that region? Thank you, Minister. Well, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question again. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I get back to their commitment to fire 100,000 yeah. workers, many of them in the health care sector, many in the education sector, that I can only imagine what our health care system would look like now had they won the, the, last, uh, the last election earlier this year. But, Mr. Speaker, in fact, when that government was in power, they didn't even measure wait times yeah. in our hospitals for important surgical and, others, and other procedures. We decided to change that, and when we came into government, we began to measure wait, wait times. In fact, we're now investing $83 million specifically to address the issue of wait times so yeah. that people can get their important procedures, yeah, including surgery procedures and cancer treatments, earlier. And if, when you look at in our hospitals, we lowered wait times. The ER wait times Answer. for sickest patients have been cut, Mr. Speaker, by 29.3%, yeah. while at the same time, the volumes in our ERs have increased by 39%. Yeah. So we're making Thank progress you. because of those investments. Yeah. Well, Minister, these cuts are, are happening again, whether you want to admit it or not. They're a result of wasted money, inability to set priorities, the uh, billions of dollars wasted on your gas plant, e-health, orange and Mars scandals, and Ontarians <clears throat> are seeing the effects of your fiscal mismanagement on the front lines of health care. It's not just in, in Hamilton and Timmins. Nurses are being fired across the province. 27 in London just recently, 22 nurses fired in Muskoka, 40 laid off in Oshawa, 40 in North Bay, and another 90 in Ottawa, and I could go on. Minister, can you tell this assembly how many more registered nurses' positions your government will cut throughout the province over this term of office? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can certainly assure the member opposite that we won't be cutting the 10,000 nursing positions that you cut when you referred yeah. your government referred to them as, as out of date, like hula hoops in the 1990s. We're actually increasing the nursing positions. Stop the clock. I'm, uh, I'm noticing a trend that I'm going to stop um, on both sides when questions are put and when answers are put. Bring it down. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's true. The truth demonstrates that. Senator, please. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Senate will come to order, and the member from Huron Bruce will come to order. Carried. So, Mr. Speaker, it is a fact that over 24,000 more nurses are working in Ontario since we took office, including more than 4,000 new nurses in 2013 alone, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. So I don't know where the member opposite is getting his information. In fact, we've added on, the, the, on our ends alone, we've added more than 10,800 RN positions since 2013. And we have programs in place that support, including the guarantee that they'll get a job coming out of graduation so that gives, gets them on that path for a Thank nursing you. career. We're continuing to invest in our nurses. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting when the Liberals talk about nursing cuts uh, when we were in office. They forget to mention the tens of thousands of nurses that we hired. There was a net increase 
when we, when we expanded telehealth that was started by the NDP, and when we established community care access centres across this province and shifted billions of dollars into frontline community home care, which no other government prior to us dared to do. Well, let's just, uh, the minister asked me where I'm getting my facts. Well, <clears throat> the president of the Ontario Nurses Association, Linda Haslam Stroud, has said recently, Ontarians have lost millions of hours of registered nurse care from their hospitals in the past two years because of flatlined hospital funding. She said your government has cut 1,600 registered nursing positions. Mm. Mr. Speaker, Question. wants to know where we get the facts. I'm quoting the president of the Nurses Association herself. Is she telling the truth? Is she not telling the truth, Minister? 1,600 positions. Thank you. How many more are you going to cut? Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, the member from Chatham Kent Essex will come to order, and I didn't get everyone quiet so that everyone can get their last shots in. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, perhaps I should start by saying Linda is not the president of the RNAO. She's the, she's the head of the Ontario Nurses Association, Mr. Speaker. And when I met her last week, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, the week before, to continue our work with our frontline nurses, with the, represent, the organizations that so aptly represent them, we are working together to continue to make progress on important issues with our nurses, as we are with Mr. all health care professionals. And Mr. Speaker, the member opposite neglects to say that we've opened 25 nurse practitioner-led clinics in this province yeah. as well. So we're not, only, we're not only expanding the use of our nurses, but we're also expanding their scope of practice, Mr. Speaker, so they can do more, so those well-trained RNs and RPNs, that they can actually Answer. provide the care that they're trained to do in our community, in our hospital right across this province. They're doing a fantastic job. I don't know why the member doesn't realize that there's always more work to be done. Thank you. We're prepared to do that. Thank you. The senior, please. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the acting premier. Selling off our hydro system didn't make sense when Mike Harris did it, and it doesn't make sense when the Liberals are doing it. We've seen this movie before, Speaker, and we know how it ends. If this government wants to ensure, ensure that Ontario can pay the bills, will they say no to privatizing hydro and say yes to closing HST loopholes that will cost us billions of dollars? Deputy Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And what I can tell you that on this side, we are saying yes to building transportation infrastructure. We are saying yes to building highways and bridges and transit. Speaker, these are important public assets that we have to pay for. So we have engaged with experts to see where, how can we recycle the assets that we hold so we can build that transportation infrastructure that Ontarians so desperately need. So, Speaker, you know, I, I think that uh, we need to maximize the benefit for Ontarians. We, are, uh, we actually laid out this plan in the budget. We laid out this plan in our uh, platform, Speaker. And What's interesting about this is that Leader of the Third Party actually ran on our fiscal plan, Answer. which included maximizing assets. Thank you, Supplementary. Speak. The Liberal government plan is one that gives the wealthiest corporations a brand new loophole so that they can write the HST off of the company car and box seats for the Leafs, while at the same time, Ontarians will have to add private hydro profits to their monthly bills because the Liberals are privatizing local hydro utilities. Both schemes, Speaker, help out those who need the help the least and leave Ontarians falling behind. Now, is this the Liberals' definition of progressive, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Speaker, you know what was progressive? The budget that we introduced in this House twice, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That talked a lot about investing in our people, investing in infrastructure, investing in public transit, investing in our children's future. The opposition, the third party, recognized the opportunities that had existed in that budget 
for the benefit of all Ontarians, and they chose not to support it. Ontarians did choose to support that budget. They did realize and recognize that we need to optimize our assets in order to contribute into those uh, investments that are going to net better returns, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly what we're doing, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Liberals like to say it was short-sighted when the Harris government sold the 407, but they're directing the sequel to that movie here and now, Speaker. Stopping new HST loopholes will keep money in the provincial treasury year after year after year money that could be used for projects like infrastructure speaker selling our local hydro utilities will bring in short-term money but leave us all paying more in the long run liberals used to oppose privatization speaker how did they lose their way minister that's rich we're not privatizing well mr speaker uh the ndp did the following they did nine private power deals when they were in office. We have made it clear that we are not going to sell off our assets. What we are doing is maximizing the opportunities to generate more revenue, more dividend for those investments that we're making in transit. And that is all we're doing. And it's, it would be irresponsible, I believe, for someone not to look at the MAC opportunities that exist within government. They choose to turn a blind eye, and yet they did exactly what they said that they're threatening us to do. They, in fact, made private power deals. We are saying we're going to protect the public interest. It's, it's the priority of what we do and what we said to uh, the council. That's exactly how we're going to proceed. Thank, Thank you. you. Final supplementary. Sorry, new question. Speaker, we didn't sell off public utilities. Uh, my next question, Speaker, is for the uh, acting premier. Auto sector jobs are at the heart of the Windsor economy and are critical to our provincial recovery. Now, I know firsthand what an auto sector job means. I know that it can raise a family. As people in this room know, my father was an Deputy auto worker, so I know what that means. And that's why, like so many people in Windsor, I was pretty frustrated to learn that Ford's new engine line is going to be located in Mexico and not in Windsor. This isn't good enough for the people of Windsor, Speaker, nor for the people of Ontario. Does the Deputy Premier get that? Well, uh, Speaker, our, our government is absolutely committed to partnering with the auto sector. We have a, uh, a very strong track record. In fact, I think there is no government in the history of this province that has done more to support the auto sector. Yeah, Speaker, we will, we will do that. We will invest taxpayer dollars, Speaker, only when there is a strong return for Ontarians. You know, I do want to say a thank you to, uh, to Jerry Diaz and to Unifor for really working hard to, uh, to seek out some possibilities. And I want to say thank you to Ford for their ongoing investments in Ontario. So, Speaker, since 2003, we've made strategic investments yes, in five auto assemblers in Ontario, as well as numerous auto plants in the, across the province. Speaker, Ontario's unemployment rate has been above the national average for years, and this province still has not recovered the 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost during the recession. Windsor has been one of the hardest hit communities in this province after almost a dozen years in government. Don't the Liberals think it's finally time for a comprehensive auto strategy in this province? Well, uh, Speaker, you know, our our government is proud of the progress we've made, but we certainly acknowledge there is more to do. We have created over half a million, 514,700 to be exact, jobs since our recessionary low in uh, 2009. The unemployment rate, Speaker, has dropped to 7.1 per cent, still too high, down from the recessionary high of 9.4 per cent, Speaker. Net new jobs since October 2003, 723,900. Oh, so, Speaker, the very member good. opposite, the leader of the third party, is working to make sure that she's trying to create the, the, uh, the idea that we're not getting the job done on this side. In fact, we are. Answer. The numbers speak for themselves, and we will continue to work hard, and we have a strategy to do that, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, 
the fact of the matter is, when it came to bringing Ford's engine plant to Windsor, the Liberals got caught flat-footed. This won't be the last time that an opportunity for new auto sector jobs comes along. We need a comprehensive strategy speaker that puts us on the front foot. When is this government going to get serious about auto sector jobs? Just to repeat, no government in the history of this province has done more for the auto sector than this government. Speaker, so let me just remind the member opposite of some of those investments. $100 million for the Oakville Assembly Complex in 2004. $98 million for the Essex plant in 2010, almost $70.9 million for additional investment in Oakville in 2013 to modernize and provide a global platform in that plant for decades to come. Speaker, there is a long list. Those are just the Ford investments. We have made other investments where they make sense for the people of this province. We will always work hard. We will always do our due diligence because we really believe in this sector. We believe in Ontario's leadership in the auto sector, and we will continue to make investments Answer. where they make sense. Thank you. New question. The member from Wellington, Home Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier, and it concerns the Mars bailout. We now know that the government changed the rules for Infrastructure Ontario loans so that it could cut a special deal for Mars after Alexandria Real Estate couldn't finish the Phase II parking lot, let alone the upper floors, throwing more good money after bad. Since 2011, the government has known about the details of the Mars Phase II loan agreement, yet has not been open and transparent about it. If no bank or conventional lender was willing to back the Mars project with only 10 per cent of it pre-leased, 30 to 40 per cent lower than conventional industry standards, why did the minister change the rules the Infrastructure Ontario rules so that the government could bail out Mars with money we don't have. Well, you know, Speaker, I, I think we have to start with what Mars is and what Mars does. It is a world renowned centre of excellent innovation and technology. It's an important part of the innovation landscape in Ontario. I would love in the supplementary to hear exactly what their plan would have been, Speaker. Would you have left that hole in the ground to just Surrounded by uh, by those construction hoarding speakers, is that your plan? Yep. Our plan. We had a problem. We've worked to address the problem. The entire loan will be repaid, Speaker. This is a very good deal for Ontarians. I know you don't like it, but I'd love to hear what you would have done in the same circumstance. Answer. Thank you. Well, okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has a problem and continues to have a problem, and the government continues to lose credibility by the day when it comes to their promises on openness and transparency. They're not being upfront about the cuts they're making to vital health care services, as we learned this morning, due to their years of fiscal mismanagement going back to 2003, and they're continuing to hide relevant facts on the $224 million bailout to Mars. The Deputy Premier should explain why they're breaking their promises to be open and transparent, and my question to her is this. If indeed the Mars documents the government refuses to release have commercially sensitive information, as they claim, then why won't they let the Estimates Committee examine them in camera? <laughs> Speaker, you know what? What you're not going to hear from the opposition, but what I think the people of Ontario need to know, is that the value of the Mars building is greater than the, our total investment in that building. So this is no bailout, Speaker. This is a, an investment. We have an asset that's worth. Members and give them a warning, and you know what that means. That's enough. Carry on, please. We have an asset speaker that's repeatedly been valued at or above the amount that has been invested. We have uh, uh, established a panel led by two eminent Ontarians, Michael Nobrega and Carol Stevenson, to give us advice, independent advice on what we do going forward. We will ensure that what we do is in the yes, best sir. interest of the taxpayers. Yeah. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister of Finance. The Ontario government directly employs more than 3,600 qualified IT professionals. However, the last five years, the portion of the government's IT budget has been outsourced to the private sector has increased by 63 per cent. 
During the 2013-14 fiscal year alone, the government spent $703 million on private sector IT services. This includes hiring almost 1,500 fee-for-service consultants at a total cost of $131 million. Why is the government expanding its use of private sector consultants when a 2012 consultants report commissioned by the Ministry of Government Services found that several key IT services cost two to three times more when provided by the private sector? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, we are investing in a number of areas to try to ensure that we procure appropriately. We have a number of IT consultants and contract works that we put out. We use RFP and procurement practices that's open and transparent, and uh, we will continue to invest in those matters that will improve our overall productivity. Uh, I know that we're managing our use of consultants through a three-pronged approach by transferring work to government staff, by creating a central pool of government IT staff to work with government-wide projects, and by centralizing the acquisition of IT consultants. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we do invest a tremendous amount of money, and we want to make certain that it's appropriately invested, and uh, we will continue to take precautionary measures to ensure that uh, it's spent appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you. The problem is, Minister, is that IT outsourcing ends up costing taxpayers more money, and they don't get value from that. The government should have learned this with eHealth. The Auditor General at the time found that the eHealth program branch alone was engaging more than 300 private IT consultants compared to fewer than 30 full-time ministry IT employees. Even a number of senior man position, management positions were held by consultants. Why is this government continuing on the wasteful and expensive path of outsourcing the government's IT services when it has thousands of highly competent IT professionals already in its employ? You are looking to save money. If you want to save money, contract in. Stop contracting out. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, we have a strong record of reducing the use of consultants across the government. In fact, uh, we have churned IT consultants when we need to gain external advice and specialized expertise. And since 2003, a total of 1,519 consultant positions government-wide have been approved for conversion into OPS staff positions, resulting in ongoing savings, Mr. Speaker, of approximately $60 million per year. And of those converted positions, 1,335 were IT consultants. And we recently uh, approved a to convert an additional 90 IT consultant positions to full-time equivalents. This will result in a further $3.6 million in the annual savings at maturity, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Lord Mr. Lord. Speaker, we're continuing to hire. We recognize the importance of that sector, Answer. and it's essential that we have the good people who are doing it and save money all the while. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question? New question? The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. <laughs> Minister, it's important that you understand why your lack of transparency around health care cuts and bad Mars bailout deals makes people nervous. Your government recently issued necessary new directives on Ebola preparedness requirements for Ontario hospitals. These new Ebola initiatives and directives will come with costs that need to be absorbed by the existing capped funding folders. Minister, can you confirm that even with your government's huge deficit, your Ministry of Health will reimburse hospitals for the cost of these preparations. Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yes, I can confirm this. And Mr. Speaker, it gives me the opportunity to talk about the preparations that Ontario is and has made with regards to preparing for the possibility that an Ebola case may arrive uh, within this province. And Mr. Speaker, we've been working uh, for a number of months now uh, with our frontline health care providers, with our hospitals, with our community agencies, with our public health specialists, with Public Health Ontario, uh, with the uh, Interim Chief Medical Officer of Health, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have put into place the protocols and the procedures and measures so that at every level of this province that we are protected uh, and have taken sufficient measures to ensure that, again, should a case arrive on Ontario shores, that we'll be prepared to deal with that effectively. And, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that we're focusing specifically and particularly yes, on the health and safety of our health care workers. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. There may be many other costs associated with the Ministry of Health's new direct 
new directive. For example, overtime pay for training staffing increases due to the need to increase rotations for exposed workers. Minister, it's important our patients and our frontline workers are safe, but your plan isn't credible without knowing how you'll pay for it. You're cutting nurses, and yet we're wondering where this funding will come from. The hospitals in my region are asking me these questions. Minister, with your Liberal government spiralling deficit and a health care budget that is already strapped to the max, how will you pay for Ebola emergency management? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just told the member opposite how we would pay for that, and we've asked our hospitals, our frontline facilities, our acute care centres to actually keep record of those additional costs so that we can then, at a later date, that we can come back and ensure that those costs are covered. I'm not sure what the member opposite is suggesting, if we somehow shouldn't be doing that or providing the level of preventive care that we are, uh, given the current risk, uh, the potential for an Ebola case arriving here. But I want to assure the Ontario public that we are taking those measures. It's important that Ontarians understand as well that cost is not a factor when it comes to the health and safety, particularly of our frontline health care workers that are working so hard to keep Ontarians safe. Answer. Mr. Speaker, in fact, I believe the way that we keep Ontarians safe and secure is by keeping our frontline health care workers safe and secure. That's why we're working so closely with them on this Ebola. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipple Belt. Merci, Monsieur Président. Ma question est également. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Health Minister and Long Term morning, Services. Some of paramedics in the GTA were prepared to do a work refusal, to refuse work because they had no training to deal with Ebola. First responder had no information on the disease, no idea how to use their protective gear, and no guarantee that the gear was even fluid resistant and up to the job. Our paramedics are on the front line each and every day, but they can only do their job if they receive the support from the Ministry of Health. Why? Was this government prepared to put our frontline health care worker in harm's way without doing everything possible to keep them safe? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I disagree. We are doing everything possible to keep our frontline health care workers safe, just as I mentioned in the uh, answer to the last question. And that includes our, our first responders, our EMS, emergency medical services as well. And we've, in fact, Mr. Speaker, as a result of my commitment to work closely with all frontline health care workers, including EMS, I committed to setting up a table, specifically a minister's advisory table, of those frontline health care workers, including EMS. In fact, last week, we had our first meeting and members representing the EMS and ambulance community were there present for that discussion that we had. We're going to be meeting on a regular basis. We're ensure we've designated as well as we've designated hospitals within the EMS system precisely uh, how that aspect of this challenge will be managed. And Mr. Speaker, I have to say as well that uh, we will, as we issued a directive uh, focused on our hospitals, we will be issuing through the interim chief medical officer health a directive specific to our frontline EMS uh, ambulance and emergency first response. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, our paramedics, our first responders are called on to do the tough work each and every day, but they should not be forced to do this at a risk to their own safety or the safety of their family. From nurses to emergency responder, our health professionals are worried about our Ebola preparedness, and this does not match what the minister is talking about. How can you explain the disconnect? between what you are saying regarding Ontario preparedness versus our frontline workers saying the exact opposite. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, due to the, uh, the close collaboration and coordination with our front, our front line health care workers, we are getting prepared and we're taking what's known in public health as the precautionary principle to make sure we're doing everything possible to ensure that our frontline health care workers are safe. And to the point where uh, Doris Green, Greenspun, who is in fact the CEO of the Registered Nurses Association yes, of Ontario, uh, last uh, or 10 days ago approximately said, I'm feeling very comfortable that we have a minister that listens and a minister that responds. And in fact, the federal health minister, Ron Ambrose, as well, indicated as a result of the measures that Ontario has, has put in place, it, this really sets the bar for the country, Mr. Speaker. So this table that we've set up, the minister's advisory table of health care providers of those frontline health care staff, I'm listening to them because I know that they're best place to be able to provide us with the advice that we need to, we need to know to ensure that we're keeping those frontline health care workers Thank you. safe and secure. A new question, the member from the Tropical North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister of Security. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Anticipated duties of a member of provincial parliament is to attend the funerals of young men who have been senselessly murdered. I had to perform such a duty not long ago while attending the funeral of 19-year-old Hamid Aminzada, a young man who was fatally injured while trying to break up a fight at Naki, North Albion Collegiate Institute. On behalf of the Premier and indeed all members here, I offer the father, Mr. Saber Aminzada, as well as the principal of Naki, Mr. Naeem Sadiq, both a figurative as well as a physical embrace, as well as a pledge of support. People in my riding of Etobicoke North and beyond deserve better. Safe communities without fear of violence or Question. gang reprisals. Speaker, on behalf of my community, I look to the Minister of Community and Safety and Correctional Services for help and direction in this matter. Thank you, Minister of Community and Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for, uh, for a very important and pertinent question. First of all, Speaker, our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of the victims of the recent acts of violence in Toronto. Speaker, our government is firmly committed to helping at-risk youth achieve a brighter future through a wide range of programs and initiatives. Our recent Youth Action Plan provides young people with supports and services to help them thrive and succeed. Speaker, we're investing over $8 million through Safer and Vital Communities Grant, focusing on community engagement, community mobilization, prevention, and, of course, education. Speaker, we have also provided over $100 million to combat guns and gangs under the Provincial Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, commonly known as PAVIS, and the Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, TAVIS. Answer. These programs, Speaker, help communities target illegal gangs, drugs, and weapons activities in communities. Of course, Speaker, we need to do more to protect our, you. our young people in our communities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister Nakvi, for your response. Uh, I know that you and I are both fathers of sons, so you no doubt can sympathize with the staggering loss that these families feel. Unfortunately, it seems that violence of many motivations seems to be now part of our society, and that there's, of course, no simple solution, quick fix or instant remedy we all appreciate to this complex issue of youth violence. And perhaps focusing purely on fighting gangs and guns will not fully achieve our goal of making our streets safer, but it is, of course, a welcome initiative. Nevertheless, Speaker, I want to know, on behalf of my community and others that are affected, what is our government doing regarding youth crime prevention? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Etobicoke North for raising this very serious and important question. As far as I'm concerned, as the Minister of Children and Youth, one child or youth death in Ontario is one too many. We want to ensure our communities are safe for our children, and we want to focus on prevention uh, in terms of these tragedies and, and that they don't happen again. We want to provide youth with opportunities so they can succeed. In 2013-14, we increased the number of youth outreach workers by one-third, from 62 to 98. These workers support over 13,600 hard-to-reach youth and young people across this province. Our government also established the Premier Council on Youth Opportunities for the youth to give their voice on how and to sir. improve the delivery and design of government programs and services. As mentioned before, we have the Youth Action Plan. We must work together and invest in our youth to ensure we stop this violence before Thank it you. starts. Thank you. A new question to members from Stormont, Dundas, and South Bengal. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, your Thank government you. came to power with a promise to focus on home care and deliver more of it to Ontarians. Instead, un instead, Ontarians are seeing quite the opposite. Many residents of my riding in Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry have seen their services either reduced or dropped altogether. The funding formula has been changed so the seniors that were on waiting lists just a few months ago no longer qualify due to new budget restrictions. Our seniors' population is growing, yet your government refuses to fund the CCACs to meet the demand. Minister, will you commit to sufficient and predictable funding for the Champlain CCAC 
or will you continue to let our seniors down? Good question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Again, at uh, our CCACs, I know we all acknowledge the important work that they do and the health care workers and non-health care workers, but the, 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 the field of individuals that provide that important care at a moment in time when, when uh, Ontarians most need it, and, uh, of course, ideally in their home, as close to home as possible. But, Mr. Speaker, we actually made a very strong commitment in the last budget that was passed earlier this year of an increase of $260 million, which is roughly a 6% increase in the, in the funding provided for home and community care. And, that, and, and in a more general sense as well, uh, apart from the fact that the, the party opposite and the member opposite actually did not support that budget, but since 2003, we've, we've virtually doubled the amount of support, Answer. financial support that goes uh, through our CCACs to assist people in home care. Thank you. Supplementary. In this current fiscal year, the Champlain CCAC is experiencing a 12 percent increase in demand for its services, yet has been allocated less than half of that amount to meet the demand, and patients are suffering. Experts agree that money spent on home care not only saves the health care system money, but allows one to enjoy the comf comfortable surroundings of their home. At the same time, the Champlain CCAC has experienced a 130 percent increase in the number of employees on the Sunshine List since 2010. Unbelievable. Minister, when demand for an agency services increases, you don't double the high earners. You double the frontline workers here, here. and the services they provide. Right on, right Residents of Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry agree. If the minister does too, does he plan to act accordingly? Good question. Okay, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, there's, there's no question that there's always more work that can be done. We all acknowledge the important work and the priority that we must pay to providing those services at home or as close to home as possible. By providing that home care, it actually lessens the burden on our hospitals and our ERs, so that it has an impact throughout the health care system. But, Mr. Speaker, I mentioned the $270 million commitment in this year's budget uh, for uh, home and community care. That, that commitment actually increases to over $750 million, Mr. Speaker, by 2017. Yeah. So we are making these investments. We are recognizing just how important, and from a cost benefit perspective as well. It's not only better in terms of quality of care and quality of life for the individuals that can benefit from home and community care, but it also, from a cost-effective perspective, it makes sense to invest these health care dollars in providing that quality of care and to sir. people as close to home as possible when and where they need it. Yeah, we Thank agree. you. New question, the member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, Highway 105 is the only highway serving the communities of Ear Falls and Red Lake in my riding. This past summer, the Ministry of Transportation replaced every culvert along the route, but instead of paving over the cut sections, they left gravel. Because the Ministry did not place adequate warning signage, these gravel sections often catch people off guard. Drivers can often lose control, and some vehicles have been damaged. Winter is coming, and these risky gravel sections need to be properly maintained and repaired, but the ministry and the private contractor can't seem to agree on who is in charge of paving these sections. Each time the ministry gave me a repair date, the date came and went and nothing happened. Snow plows have already been out along this highway and snow is expected again in Redmond Question. tomorrow. Will the minister tell us for certain when Highway 105 will be completed? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I appreciate uh, receiving that question from the member opposite. I, I know that we had a chance to, uh, to exchange correspondence last week here in this legislature. I also know that uh, staff in my office have been in touch with that member's constituency office. I certainly under, understand and respect where she's coming from, and I know that she's uh, doing a, a job to represent her community. I know that my office will continue to work closely with her office and her community to make sure that this can be addressed. I, you know, you, the, the member opposite mentioned the, uh, the, the, the matter or the issue of winter maintenance, Speaker. It's why I was very happy to stand in my place in the House last week and discuss uh, the significant uh, additional resources that we're bringing to bear this year to anticipate and deal with and be prepared for the upcoming winter season, Speaker. So, of course, I'll continue to work closely with that member and her community uh, to make sure that we can uh, be prepared yes, for the sir. winter season, and I look forward to the ongoing conversation, Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Supplementary. Thank you. 
Thank you, Speaker. The people of Air Falls and Red Lake depend on Highway 105. They can't simply take another route if the road conditions on Highway 105 are unsafe. And it shouldn't be the case that only the squeaky wheel gets the grease and people will only receive action after I literally hound this government. This ministry keeps cutting corners when it comes to maintaining Highway 105. This highway has been classified as a low priority for snow clearance, and now the ministry has left this culvert repair job unfinished with winter fast approaching. There will be accidents this winter if the ministry does not properly manage the gaps between the MTO and its private contractors. Will the minister personally make sure this job gets done within days and not weeks? Uh, speaker, as I said in uh, my response to the initial question, I'm uh, very happy to be able to continue to work alongside this member to deliver positive results for her community. Again, it's one of the reasons I was so happy to answer a question in the House last week from the member from Newmarket or very happy to participate in an announcement the week before where we talked specifically about the new resources bringing to bear uh, both in southern and northern Ontario. Last winter season, uh, spe winter season, for example, Speaker, our government launched or put 55 new pieces of equipment on the roads in northern Ontario to help make sure that as the season last year finished that we were prepared to deal with the weather. We are doing the same thing again this, uh, this, uh, this year, Speaker, not only in the north but also in the south. Again, I undertake to continue working with this member and Speaker, all members in this legislature, to make sure that our roads and highways across Ontario Answer. Uh, that we're prepared for the upcoming winter season because road safety is one of my most important priorities. Thanks very much, Thank Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member for the rest. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, no matter what time of the year it is, parks provide great opportunities for families and visitors to enjoy recreational activities and learn more about conservation and our environment. In my town, Presqu'île Provincial Park is open for day use all year round. It is home to over 10 kilometers of trails that travel through the several habitat and fantastic vantage points along Lake Ontario. Presqu'île also provides natural heritage education programs, which include curriculum-based children program for schools in the spring and fall. And I'd be remiss if I don't plug the Christmas of Presqu'île Arts and Craft Show, which is coming up November 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 8th, and 9th. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could the Minister please explain to the House what our government is doing to ensure that Ontarians from all parts of the province have the opportunity to enjoy our provincial parks? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, thank you, and I want to thank the member from uh, Northumberland, Quinney West, for his question and for drawing attention to a very important part of Ontario's social, social and natural heritage. Our parks are a great way for families to be active and learn more about wildlife and Ontario's environment. Ontario has 109 operating parks across the province, from Quetico Provincial Park in Atacokan to Wheatley Provincial Park in southwestern Ontario. These parks see over 8.5 million visitors each year supporting jobs and strengthening local communities. Residents and tourists from around the world come to our parks and enjoy spectacular views and to take part in unique outdoor activities. In fact, Ontario Parks is the largest provider of outdoor recreation opportunities in our province. Our government remains committed to ensuring that all Ontarians, whether in the north or the south, have access to provincial parks. And, sir, I would encourage everyone in this House and families from all parts of Ontario to visit one of our provincial here, here. parks this fall and take advantage of the more than 2,200 kilometres of trails through some of the province's Thank most you. spectacular scenery. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. As the 2014 campus season comes to a close in many of our provincial parks, my constituents are already anticipating next, um, next summer and are looking to reserve their campsites for 2015. Speaker, I understand that two years ago our government was faced with a difficult decision regarding the operating status of Fushimi Lake, Rainy Brunel, and Ivanhoe Lake provincial parks. And I'm pleased that this government has been planted a pilot and formed partnership with local municipalities to maintain the camp camping for the past two years. The pilot program at these three parks now ended. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could the Minister please update the House on the status of these parks and confirm if they will be open for the 2015 camping season? Got to go Here, fish. Minister. Speaker, thanks. And again, I want to thank the member from uh, Northumberland, Quinney West, for this very time timely and, and thoughtful question. And I am pleased, Speaker, to inform the House that our government will be operating, in fact, Ivanhoe, Rene Brunel, and Fushimi Lake Provincial Parks for the 2015 camping season. 
Speaker, I really want to take a moment, as I did uh, last week, and, and in my phone calls to the local folks, to thank the municipalities, the broader communities, the mayors, um, everybody who really uh, took this issue to task, and they did a great job in putting us in a position as local municipalities, where, whereby we are in a position to actually make this announcement and move forward with an extension of this uh, particular pilot program. The partnerships with Hearst, Moonbeam, and Timmins were key to providing Ontarians with recre recreational opportunities in our beautiful parks. So, Speaker, this is a fantastic uh, news story. We Answer. are very pleased as a government to have entered into a partnership where we, now we are taking full responsibility for the next year on these provincial parks and hopefully Thank looking you. forward to more positive news in the years to follow. Thank you. New question. The member for the for the Minister of Energy. Minister, with each passing day, the effect of your flawed energy policies become more and more apparent. Yep. From exasperated seniors to struggling small businesses to manufacturers leaving the province. Yep. The results are the same. Ontario's rates are making it uncompetitive in the world market. Now, some more bad news. On Saturday, rates are going up again. Mm -hmm. They will be up to 14 cents a kilowatt hour, which is more than triple what it was when your party took power. Skyrocketing hydro, hydro rates have become a second tax on manufacturing and small business, which kills jobs or sends them to Mexico. Yet, you're still signing expensive contracts for intermittent, unreliable power. Minister, is Question. it not time to reverse the policies that have made a few Liberal insiders very rich at the expense Thank of you. everyone else? Tax Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question uh, from the minister, although I'm a bit surprised by the uh, scope of it and how broad leader. the question is, because he did attend my speech to the Ontario Energy Association about two weeks ago, which was a 20-minute speech, Mr. Speaker, and afterwards he told me he agreed with everything that was in it. He couldn't disagree with anything. And, however, Mr. Speaker, uh, as he knows, uh, the Ontario Energy Board uh, does the rating for, uh, for prices in the province of Ontario. And uh, as of November 1, 2014, the new prices will increase average monthly time of use bills by about 1.7%, or 2.3 cents uh, on the average house household. Uh, our government modernized an electricity system that needed significant upgrading territories. Uh, the current price results in electricity bills that are below the forecast we set in the 2013 long-term energy plan. Knew that. And when I get to the uh, supplementary, Mr. Speaker, I'd be Thank very you. happy to speak to the industrial rates that he referred Thank to. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister did deliver a good speech. Unfortunately, his policies are delivering jobs to Mexico. Yeah, exactly. Minister, you know that by continuing to sign new expensive energy contracts, Ontarians will continue to endure higher prices. You know that new intermittent energy, when it comes online, you will have to sell more power at a loss to our competitors yep. at a time when we don't need it. Yep. You know that peak and off-peak hydro rates rise Ontario's ability it, when, you, when they rise, Ontario's ability to compete falls. Minister, I'll ask you again, will you stop exporting jobs to Mexico and place affordability as a cornerstone of Ontario energy policy? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member knows that uh, we had significant price pressures because we converted to a clean system and we went from deficit to surplus. In, in those price pressures, Mr. Speaker, we have, over a period of the last several years, created very significant price mitigation measures, Despite including that. in the industrial sector, uh, expanding the IEI program so hundreds of newly eligible companies can qualify for electricity rates among the lowest in North America, Mr. Speaker. In Pembroke, his hometown, Mr. Speaker, the MDF paper board plant is reopening, has yes. reopened after being accepted into the program, creating 100 40 new jobs for the wow. area. There are significant companies across the province accessing that. And he will also know that in our budget, Mr. Cheryl Speaker, Blanco, we had two provisions yes, uh, to mitigate prices further for the industrial Cheryl sector. I'm very happy to uh, arrange a briefing for the member, Mr. Speaker, so he will learn about how we have taken significant 
steps to mitigate electricity prices in the province of Ontario. Your question, the member from Nipahol. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, house, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Hundreds of Ontarians have tweeted the Premier about the value of midwives to the family of this province. Midwives Mondays, as the campaign is known, have shown an outpouring of support for the services that midwives provide. Yet, this Liberal government is refusing to engage in fair negotiations with midwives allowing expired contracts and pay inequity to undermine this much-loved health care profession. It is time for this government to change course, and I think that this Monday is a perfect time to do it. After all of these tweets from all of these family, my question is quite simple, Speaker. Did the minister get the message? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm really feeling the love this morning from both, uh, both parties, so I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, uh, as a government, we value our midwives. Yes. Uh, fortunately, I'm also on the receiving end of those tweets that go to uh, the Premier, and I have to say, uh, it might surprise some, I look forward to Mondays when I receive 400 or 500 <laughs> tweets coming from not just from midwives, but from many individuals who have and are benefiting from our midwives. Mr. Speaker, we uh, are so committed to uh, ensuring that our midwives have the support uh, that they need to carry out their work effectively. We have increased their compensation on average uh, by 33 per cent since we took office in 2003. Uh, but we are working closely with them to ensure we're providing them not only on the financial side, but in terms of the other supports that we provide to them. Thank you. That is able to make a difference. Thank you, Speaker. Well, let me uh, give you an idea of the government's record with midwives. First, the Liberal government is refusing to negotiate in good faith and forcing midwives to work without a contract for months on end. Then, the Liberals are refusing to recognize the gender gap that leaves the midwife being paid less for work of equal value, for what they deserve. And the Liberals are refusing to meet the demands for midwife, meaning that many, many families continue to be turned away from the care they want. It makes no sense to deny midwives the respect that they deserve. How can the minister explain his stubborn refusal to resume negotiation with midwives and his indefensible opposition Question. to pay equity? Thank you, Minister. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, we've doubled the number of, of midwives in this province since 2003 to 700 now. The funding for the midwifery program has increased fivefold, Mr. Speaker, yeah. from $23 million in 2003 to $125 million. In 2003, 8,000 women families were able to benefit from midwives. Now that figure is 22,000. And I would say, not unimportantly, Mr. Speaker, I had the honor and privilege with my wife Sam at home, our first and only child, being born oh. at home with two midwives. It was an incredible experience. I understand firsthand just how important this resource is. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, a resource that worldwide delivers most of the babies that are born on this planet. So we are committed. Yes, we we'll continue to work closely with our midwives. I'm committed to that, and we will continue to grow this important profession. Yes. Thank you. New question? Member from Gary. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services and responsible for women is women's issues. Minister, first of all, I would like to thank you and the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs on behalf of my caucus colleagues for participating in the National Aboriginal Women's Summit last week. I think it is imperative that we, as a government, stand alongside Ontario's First Nations, Métis, Inuit and urban Aboriginal communities. I would also like to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for introducing a private member's motion last week, supporting, <laughs> supporting the National Aboriginal Organization's call for the federal government for a national inquiry into mi missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. Question. I would also like to. Oh. 
I was wondering, Minister, if you could tell us more about your work at the summit and what work the Ontario Women's Directorate has been doing on this issue. Thank you, Thank you. Minister of Youth and Children's Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Barrie for her question. Um, as we talked about in the House here last week during uh, uh, the member from Kingston the Islands uh, private members' resolution, the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group and the National Aboriginal Women's Summit Steering Committee are leading the development of a socio-economic plan for Aboriginal women and girls. The discussion last week at the summit began the development of this plan. I was very pleased to be there representing our wonderful province along with my colleague, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. We met with leaders, uh, provincial ministers, senior officials from Canadian provinces, Ontario, to discuss the approach. Unfortunately, the federal government wasn't their speaker, uh, but we did focus on issues around murdered and missing Aboriginal children. Our budget speaker for this year includes $2 million over two years to support our joint work yes, on violence against Aboriginal women. This includes five Aboriginal uh, organizations and 10 ministries. It's the only committee of this kind. Thank you, Speaker. We look forward to getting Thank you. the results that plan in about 18 months. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for her response. Aboriginal women are 2.5 times more likely to experience spousal violence than non-Aboriginal women, according to self-reported data. Between 2001 and 2011, at least 8 per cent of all murdered women aged 15 years and older were Aboriginal, double their representation in the Canadian population. The RCMP reports police recorded incidents of Aboriginal female homicides and unresolved Aboriginal missing Aboriginal women total 1,181 as of November 2013. So this is very important work, and I'm happy to follow the progress of the Ontario Women's Directorate. There is no question. Thank you. <laughs> Minister, <laughs> Sir, Children and Youth Services. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Speaker. Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, my visit to the National Aboriginal Women's Summit with Minister uh, McCharles was very productive. The forum provided an excellent opportunity to share expertise and knowledge and to work on initiatives, including the Socioeconomic Action Plan and the National Roundtable. I was very pleased that all parties present agreed that the next roundtable will take place in February 15 in the Northwest Territories. The issues we talked about affect all Aboriginal women, all Ontarians, indeed all Canadians, and we need to get everyone working together to make progress on this issue. But it is unfortunate, it is inexcusable that the federal government chose not to send any representation to that summit. The federal government has a role to play. I urge them to contribute to the upcoming meeting in NWT. Answer. To the federal government, I say, come to the next meeting and do your duty. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.